Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad that you decided to join us. We're studying the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the second quarter of 2012. This series is entitled Witness, Witnessing and Evangelism. And this is lesson number five in that series entitled Sequential Evangelism and Witnessing. That's a provocative title. What do you suppose it means? Let's begin with a word of prayer and see if we can figure it out. Our kind Father, there are a lot of people out there with a lot of different ideas and challenges and backgrounds and, and problems in their lives. How do we reach out to them? How do we touch them where they are and, and influence them for your kingdom? That's the question we want to discuss today, to try to understand sequential witnessing. Guide us. Send us the Holy Spirit to speak words that you want us to speak, to witness your kind of good news. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What steps do we need to go through to when we ask people to become Seventh-day Adventists? Is there a defined path? You do this first, you learn this, then you learn this, then you learn this. And how far back do we go? I mean, do we need to start by convincing people that they need to read the Bible? Do we need to convince them that God exists? Uh, do we need to convince them that God loves them? Do we need to convince them that heaven exists? Do we need to say, let me show you how to go to heaven? Depends where they're at. That's the, exactly the point. It depends where they're at. What do you think is happening in our world today? Do you think that the average person walking down the street is more biblically literate or more biblically illiterate? Day by day. Illiterate. Illiterate. Just incredibly illiterate. I, I listen to some of the quiz shows on TV every once in a while because it's usually during the time when I'm eating. And, you know, they ask some very basic questions and people stand up there with their mouths hanging open. They have not the, I mean, you know, well, they've asked teenagers questions like, what are Sodom and Gomorrah? Aren't they husband and wife? You know, who was Noah's wife? Joan of Arc. You know, this just gives you an idea of how biblically illiterate people really are. In our day. So where do we start? But both Peter and Paul recognize that new beginners, people who are first becoming Christians, need to be given simple, easy to understand truths from the gospel. We're asking them to change their whole way of thinking. If we're, if we're honest, we're saying, okay, I want you to change your paradigm, the whole way you think about reality. That's not easy. So we, we have to be careful not to overwhelm them with too many facts and ideas and things that are strange to them at the beginning. So Peter and Paul suggested we must give them the milk, the spiritual word. So that's our first big question for today. What's the milk of the spiritual word, the milk of the word? Yeah, Dennis. Well, that's not the question I was uh, going to attempt to answer. Okay. Back towards your first question, mm -hmm. sequential evangelism. Mm -hmm. now, the pastor in our local church passed out a book uh, entitled something like Growing an Adventist Church by a professor, I think it's Burl, mm -hmm. uh, who is now retired from the seminary. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if I uh, remember correctly, he was saying it takes about five social contacts with an Adventist, favorable social contacts with an Adventist, before you can bring him into the church the first time. With a person to bring him into the Adventist church? Yes, to get him to walk through the door. Okay. That they need to have favorable uh, experiences. So he was, he was promoting uh, things like uh, I, I envisioned as a, a CHIP program, a coronary uh, uh, health improvement program, uh, five-day stop smoking clinic, that, that we need to interact with people 
at the level of their needs. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, we may capture their attention to the point that they say, oh, maybe there's uh, something about these people that we like. I, um, your, your comment reminds me of a story. We had a pastor come and give us an, a series, a whole week-long series for pastors. And this was in East Africa, in Tanzania. A week-long series for pastors about how to be more effective in their, in their church ministries and so forth. This man came from South America. And he told us about his story. He said he finished his training at the seminary down there in South America. He uh, went out. He was, for one year, he worked under a couple different pastors as a kind of youth pastor. Then the general, con I mean, not the general conference, the conference president called him into his office one day. He says, okay, it's time for you to start, really seriously. He says, I'm going to give you a church at such and such a place. I'm going to give you, I'm going to send you to such and such a place. Not an Adventist there at all. A, a city where there's not a single Adventist. When you have raised up a church, there are 200 members, and the church building is paid for, I will ordain you. Oh. How well would we do with that kind of a program? Wow. How bad do you want to be ordained? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, what would we do if we got sat down in a place where there was no Adventist at all? Yeah. Now, this, is a, this is a real story, and he told us about his experiences, some of his experiences. Well, last week we talked about felt needs. Surely, surely, in a time right now of an economic downturn, there are people with felt needs. There are people who have physical needs. They're sick. There are people who have, you know, bodily needs. They're hungry. There are people who are homeless. There are people who need clothes. There are others who are simply depressed or anxious. Aren't those ways in which we theoretically could, could, could reach out to those people? If we could help them in those areas of felt needs, and is that why Adventism is so much into the health ministry? Because everybody who comes to our doors, I mean, people flock into our doors with felt needs, right? You can build a mega church, thousands and thousands of members, by satisfying people's felt needs. Is that a bad thing? Yes, if that's as far as you go. Okay, but that's that's. The it's a good thing, but if that's if that becomes the end of your of your message. And there's never a call to repentance, mm -hmm. then you've missed the boat. Okay, but we Adventists seem to have problems even getting to first base. That's right. And this is how we need to get to. Was one of the ways we potentially could get yeah. to, to, to first base. It's true. During his ministry, and I quote from Ellen White. This is Ministry of Healing, page 19, caught paragraph four. During his ministry, Jesus devoted more time to healing the sick than to preaching. Why did he do that? That's where the needs of the people were, and the people recognized it, and Jesus met their needs. On another occasion, this is spelled out in Councils on Health, page 503, paragraph 3, a doctor wrote to Ellen White and says, maybe, I sh maybe the time is Jesus is for Jesus to come is going to be very soon. Maybe I should stop practicing medicine and just go out and start preaching. And she says, that's wrong. She says, if you are a competent physician and you are a Christian, you can do tenfold more good for God than if you go out merely to preach the word. What does that tell us? Why, why yeah. would God make such statements? I have a question. When a person is meeting felt needs mm -hmm. or a physician is dealing with people, how does that person know that the person helping is a Christian? I mean, do you, meet, do you meet felt needs and not mention anything about your Christianity? How many worldlings you know out there are reaching out with a truly loving spirit to meet felt needs? I live sort of in a new age community, and they are. Well, that's amazing. Maybe this is one of Satan's disguises. Uh, that's, that's part of, of using truth Mm -hmm. and only goes so far. And yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. 
And when Jesus was healing people, after he healed them, do you think that those people thought he had healed them or that there was a God in heaven who had healed them? Did he point them to his Father? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's one of the other challenges that we have. Because you can meet people. I mean, you can stand on the corner and hand out food, and you will meet people's felt needs. Christian groups went to the Far East many years ago, 100 years ago now, and started passing out, feeding people who were really hungry. And boy, they just got in a massive response until troublous times started coming, and communism came in and so forth, and all those Christians just sort of melted into the woodwork. And so we develop a term called rice Christians. And that's Does not that what we're looking mean for. We'll give you food, but we'll disappear. Well, yeah. That means so long as we're getting what we need, we'll stick around as soon as you're not feeding us physically. I mean, r look at the story in John 6, same story. Jesus said, the reason you're all come to hear me now is because you got fed last night. I said, I want to feed you my body and my blood. And they said, we don't know what you're talking about. We're out of here. Well, there's a very challenging verse, set of verses starting in Matthew 25, starting with verse 34. Jesus says, and this is a parable that you're all familiar with, a parable of the sheep and the goats. I was hungry and you fed me, thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you received me in your homes, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me, in prison and you visited me. And the righteous will then answer him, when, when, Lord, did we ever see you hungry or feed you or thir and feed you or thirsty and gave you a drink, give you a drink? When did we ever see you a stranger and welcome you in our homes or naked and clothe you? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you did this for one of the least important of these members of my family, you did it for me. You know, I think an excellent way for the church to do that the families are just fractured in today's world and people are hurting from not having family relationships and the potlucks that the Adventists do and where you sit down and pray and then you have a meal and there's conversation like my nephew said he says the Adventists you can talk to because they they're no, not going anywhere uh, all Saturday he says they just plunk themselves down where you know you go to a Sunday church and after church whoosh, they're out of there to the mm -hmm. ball game or whatever. And so I think it is a wonderful witness because coming in you have people that you just don't know how they're mentally hurting, physically hurting, people that are at the hospital with long-term mm -hmm. illnesses uh, or their family members. And it's just such a wonderful ministry that I think that all Adventist churches should try to do that for the community. We've got a hospital full of people right over here, a couple blocks from us, that are, could be witness to at any moment. Mm -hmm. Well, what, how has religion got such a bad name? In Martin Luther's day, the church was so dominant in society, and the church leaders spoke so consistently of the idea that one had to get his or her sins forgiven in a specific way, if one wanted to avoid hell, the people felt compelled to do what the church told them to do. They hated it, but they did it. They were afraid not to. By contrast, in our day, people are doing everything possible to promote the idea that the church and God are optional. I heard on the news the other day something I almost sat down and, and sent a message to them. I, I felt like it. Well, you know, people are arguing about, it happened to be about same-sex marriage because someone had brought a one of the states was taking action or something like that. And they said, this is not a biblical issue. It doesn't have nothing to do with Christianity. This is a social issue. We need to decide for ourselves. And I, I wanted to sit down and say, and I'm not to say anything about that particular issue, but I, I, I wanted to write and say, you obviously don't understand Christianity at all. If Christianity doesn't affect every single thing you do all day long in your lives and everything you do with everybody around you, it's not Christianity at all. 
That's what I wanted. I didn't, but I wanted to. Yeah. When I've gone to churches in the past, um, they would, um, Christianity was just um, uh, such a small part of a person's life. Mm -hmm. And it was so frustrating. And what is so wonderful about the Adventist message is that you, it teaches you how to bring that spiritual realm into your personal life mm -hmm. and then start living like a Christian. That is not covered in all churches. Yeah. How do we convince the people around us that the church, the Bible, even God, religion are relevant to their lives today? There are many, many who are very comfortable as they are. Mm -hmm. They have no need whatsoever. So why change? Mm -hmm. Exactly. If things are going swimmingly, exactly. why would you want to change? And besides, look at how some of these Adventists behave anyway. Right. Why would I want anything to do with them or their God? So does that mean then that we should just forget about all those people out there that are, have nothing to do with the church and we ought to focus just on people who are maybe attending other churches? At least they have some background we can build on. Well, Jesus sent the disciples out to the villages. Mm -hmm. And then if the people didn't want to listen, he says, dust your shoes off and go on to the next one. So. Mm -hmm. There's a, a finite amount of time you're going to spend mm -hmm. on it. You know, the Bible has a lot to offer. I think we need to really stick close to the Bible and Bible study. Because I got a master's <coughs> in counseling before I became a Christian. Mm -hmm. Talk about a bunch of fooey and theories. And <laughs> I'm not kidding. And I got into the Bible and studying the Bible. It has more psychology yes. in it than you will ever find in a master's degree in a public mm -hmm. university. <laughs> well, I mean, let's, let's, let's be honest now. The most effective way to get people to walk through the front doors of the church is to befriend them. Mm -hmm. If you're really friends with them and then someday you say, well, we're putting on a church, a program at the church, Maybe it's not anything to do with church itself. It might be uh, some kind of a musical program or something like that. And you invite them to the church. You have much greater chance of getting them to actually come to church and then potentially to follow up and come back for something else than if you just hand them a, path, a pamphlet or something else like that. I know that that's hard work. I know a lady from a Nazarene church. And her and her ladies, they have a ministry and they will provide a potluck and the preacher will provide a funeral service for whoever in the community wants one. They don't have to belong to their church. The preacher will do it. The ladies will provide the potluck. I think they ask for a little money to buy the, they have chicken and um, potato salad and stuff. And, and then the relatives of the family come who may have never been in a church. And it's absolutely amazing what that little ministry does. And so, I mean, if anybody doesn't have anybody to bury them, this church is ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it should be obvious that we're not suggesting any quick fix to the church's evangelism program. These efforts we think we're talking about require effort and time and careful study. Uh, the ideal situation would be as if we would, we would have a group of friends and then you invite a new person to join us in our group of friends and we're studying the Bible together in our home. That, that would be ideal. Um, you know, sometimes I kind of wonder if, um, if evangelism is just like trying to get people into the club mm -hmm. <coughs> type of thing. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of might be thinking, they may not be thinking about their souls, you know, as far mm -hmm. as salvation goes, or even leading them to the truth you know, that somehow I want them to get them into our ark because this is, everybody in this ark is going to be the one that will be saved. All the other arks, uh, stay away from them. They have holes in their, their uh, <laughs> bows or whatever. So um, we, we need to think about why we're doing this and keep that in mind. Here, here's the challenge. We ultimately are going to need to present to people unpopular and maybe even unwanted truths. They may be truths, but they're not popular. 
We want them to reorient their lives according to these unpopular truths. So, how did Jesus do at teaching unpopular truths? There's a, very inter a couple of very interesting verses. first one is found in Luke 18, starting with verse 31. Jesus is walking with his disciples in a huge crowd of people from Jericho up to Jerusalem just before the final Passover. A week from this experience, we're going to read right now, a week from this experience, Jesus has already been crucified. Okay, it's one week left in his life, and he knows that. Start with Luke 18, start with verse 31. Jesus took the twelve disciples aside, amidst all these people that are rushing up the hill, and said to them, Listen, we are going to Jerusalem, where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles, who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. Now, have I said any words so far that are really difficult to understand? They will whip him and kill him. But three days later, he will rise to life. Now, is any of those words hard to understand? But the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of these words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. Jesus had spent three and a half years with some of these disciples. Some of them he'd only spent maybe a year and a half or two years with them. He had been with them day and night, almost incessantly for that whole time. And he, this is the fourth time he's talked to him about the fact that he's going up to be crucified and they could not conceive of even the words, the simple words that came out of his mouth. What was the problem? Didn't even ask, uh, what, what would they do that? They wouldn't even, they didn't even ask. No. Well, to come to their defense a little bit, mm -hmm. don't you think all those words go clear against their narrative of what the Messiah was supposed to do? Well, I, I, I admit that, but you're walking with the Messiah. I know, but there still. he is. He's telling you what's going on, and we're on our way up to Jerusalem. And they have seen the problems he's 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 stirred up every time he goes to Jerusalem. That's just a good example of how off track we can be mm -hmm. and be totally ignorant of what what God is trying to Could tell that us. Could that have something to do while we have a little trouble spreading the gospel? I wonder. Well, th that speaks to the issue, at least in my mind. You were talking about the, the talk show host or whoever was, was making, uh, making those comments. Uh, I would have a, an extremely difficult time talking to someone like that, even my neighbor, mm -hmm. because th th his paradigm or their paradigm is so much different than mine that I would have nothing in common to talk about. They had nothing to... To, to, to so share. We, need to, we need to practice walking in their moccasins? Well, that uh, something, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's another statement from Jesus. Now, this is even closer. Now, now we're down to John 16, verse 12. This is like the last few words that Jesus said to disciples before he was arrested and taken out to be crucified. I have much more to tell you, but now it would be too much for you to bear. And he goes on to say, when, however, the Spirit comes, who reveals the truth about God, does that tell you what kind of truth he wanted to tell them? He will lead you into all the truth. He will not speak of his own, on his own authority, but he will speak of what he hears and will tell you of things to come. Jesus himself, the best teacher who ever lived on this earth, could not teach these disciples that he specifically, he picked them out because he said, these are the best possible people for me to work with. And he spent all that time with them, and he still couldn't convince them yeah, but, what was going to happen to him. Yeah, but uh, you got to look at the whole, the whole swath of the time, don't you? Why, why do Even you? the cross is part of their, their lesson. Yeah. And when that was over with, that was the end of the lesson, and that's when they finally got it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't be halfway through the lesson and criticize them just because they couldn't understand right then the lesson how is many, not how over many with. Years, th and that's my question. How many years is these lessons supposed to take? Well, it depends on the person. depends what you're talking about. depends on the context of where you're well, at. Okay, at so my next question is, in our world where everybody wants to exercise total and complete freedom, don't tell us what to do. We want to do what we want to do. 
How, how do we, how do we, how are we going to reach out to those people? How do we convince those kind of people that Jesus is one, is number one, coming again soon, and number two, he's going to put you on the judgment stand? If they're well enough, well off economically and health wise, it's pretty tough to break, break into them. Well, and then, and then if they got their fire insurance premium paid up, <laughs> it's even worse. If you're fortunate enough to understand that that's what they're thinking about freedom, that they want to be able to have this complete freedom, mm -hmm. you could probably start there and start having discussions about freedom. What is all that, uh, that about? Yeah. Before you even talk about Jesus. Well, and we talk about, you know, how, what difficulty we might have trying to teach them some lessons. How many even of Adventists understand could sit down and give you a Bible study for each one of the 28 basic doctrines of the Adventist church? How many, how many could? Could you, yeah. If I said, okay, let's pick number 15. Give me a Bible study on number 15. Well, I would never go that direction because I don't think that's the way to go myself. Okay, but, I'm just saying. But um, If I asked you about, I don't even remember what number 15 is, but if, if I asked you, could you give me a, a, a Bible study on the Trinity? Is it our responsibility to have in our homes ready to go a Bible study um, series of literature from Bachelor, Voice of Prophecy, or wherever, mm -hmm. so that we are ready, if asked, mm -hmm. that we would have See, that's, the aid? That's one thing I would never do. I would, I would go from my experience, because I think I could relate to it better. But I can't if, I took, if I took Bachelor stuff and started reading that, to me, I think that's just kind of second but it's class a, stuff. It's a guide as to where the verses are. Can you remember where the verses are? No. I'm going like, I read this someplace. I don't I remember I know, but where even that guide there is, is, is fixed up for a certain sequence well, that somebody else thinks is great, yeah. but I may not think it's that great. Well, maybe uh, because I'm a teacher, you follow, the, you get the other teacher's guidelines. And you only use it as a little guideline, maybe 10% of it, and the rest, 90%, is you. Uh, right. So you okay. throw what's, out... What's oh. going to happen if you lose your 10%? Well, let's look at this. <laughs> Revelation 13 tells us that the, at the end of time, the devil is going to conduct the most successful evangelistic campaign of all time. The whole world is going to wander after the beast. Is it possible that this emphasis, which is just sweeping the world through television, through the internet, and so forth, that leave us alone, we're going to do what we want to do. That's exactly the message which Satan preached in heaven. Mm. Is, this, is this the beginning of that final message, that final evangelistic campaign? Oh. Is it very likely that pretty soon the whole world is already, without even thinking to have anything to do with religion, they're going to be square in Satan's camp. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it kind of a, a difference between what you perceive that to be versus what I perceive that to be? I have no like, idea how you, like you perceive it to be. Like you would think that this is going to happen in the future. I think it's happening right now. I, I'm saying I think it's, it's happening already, right now. I think it's already here. Mm -hmm. It's already happening. Yeah, no, I, I believe it's happening. That's, what, that's my point. I'm saying these people, without even realizing it has anything to do with religion, are moving themselves into a very, very selfish paradigm exactly where Satan wants them. Among methods, not that this is the only one, go to your neighbors one by one. Come close to them till their hearts are warmed by your unselfish interest in love. Sympathize with them. Pray with them. Watch for opportunities to do them good. And as you can, gather a few and open the word of God to their darkened minds. Keep watching as he who must render an account for the souls of men and make the most of the privileges that God gives you of laboring with him in his moral vineyard. Mm -hmm. The reference? Uh, Review and Herald, March 13, 1888. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, we start out by talking about both Peter and Paul mentioned that there's milk and then there's solid food. That's what the idea of sequential evangelism is all about. 
Look at John 6, starting with verse 54. And this is, remember, after Jesus has fed them the night before, he fed the 5,000 men, and not counting women and children, there are probably 20,000 people he fed out there. And then he went across, the, the, the Gal, across Galilee at nighttime. He was trying to sort of let them alone. He, and he showed up in Capernaum. Pretty soon they found him there. Okay, when do we get breakfast, okay? You know, that was their message. When do we have breakfast? And Jesus said, you remember, and, and I'm reading these verses. Jesus said to them, I am telling you the truth. This is verse 53. If you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in yourselves. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them to life on the last day. For my flesh is the real food, my blood is the real drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood live in me and I live in them. The living Father sent me, and because of him I live also. In the same way, whoever eats me will live because of me. This then is the same way whoever eats me will live because of me. This then is the bread, I'm sorry, this then is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the bread that your ancestors ate, of course talking about the manna in, in, the, in the Sinai Peninsula. They later died, but those who eat this bread will live forever. Jesus said this as he taught in the synagogue in Capernaum. And what's the response? Verse 60, many of his followers heard this and said, this teaching is too hard. Who can listen to it? Now, what what did Jesus mean by that? It just sounds... Crazy. Yes. Well, I have a little help here from Ellen White. Let me see if I can find the quotation. Anyway, she says that, um, and we'll get to it a little bit later. I see it's a little bit further. Well, maybe I'll just pop down there right now uh, where it talks about it. Christ drew the hearts of his hearers to him by the manifestation of his love, and then, little by little, as they were about to bear it, or well, as they were able to bear it, he unfolded them the great truths of the kingdom. We also must learn to adapt our letters to the conditions of the people to meet men where they are. And then she said, and I quote one more place here. Right there. Christ used the figure of eating and drinking to represent the nearness to him which all must have who are at least partakers with him in his glory. Now let's think about this for a moment. What does that mean? When you eat food, what happens to that food? It goes inside you. And? Becomes part of you. Becomes part of you. It actually becomes a part of your body. It travels all the way through. Of course, some part of it's just waste and it goes on out. But m the most part of it, the reason you eat it is because of the part that becomes a part of you. That's what he's talking about. He's saying, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, it means you take in Jesus Christ and it becomes a part of you. Go on, when going you get, on. When you get to that point, it's part of knowing God. Yeah. And that's eternal life, he says there just before he... The sorry. temporal food we eat is assimilated, giving strength and solidity to the body. In a similar manner, as we believe and receive the words of the Lord Jesus, they become a part of our spiritual life bringing light and peace, hope and joy, and strength to the soul as physical food strengthens the body. That's Ellen White in the book Lift Him Up, page 105. Do you think when we get to heaven that we're going to see that when we had Christ in us, our spiritual cells thrived? I mean, that there's mm -hmm. a dimension that we don't even know about and our spiritual little bodies got mm -hmm. healthy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we're still f struggling with that challenge of how do we how do we attract people? How do we how do we reach out to them? Um, you know what you just read there, though. Um, how do we attract people? To some, it was kind of offensive. The eating e my e blood, drinking my yeah. Uh, Christians have been blood. called cannibals. Yeah, yeah, but. Um, uh, if the point is, is to try to adapt your talk to where they're at, it seemed like that was a little bit, shall we say, Char overdone or overdone? overcharged or something. You're not, you're not trying to suggest that maybe you could have done better than Jesus. No, no, no. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> trying to see if we can bring something out of this. Uh, uh -huh. Because it's not necessarily 
massaging the mm -hmm. message to, so it fits them perfectly. There was some kind of hard edge to it too yeah. that they had to, to endure. Well, here's a challenge. How do we convince people to do what is right because it is right? Not because it's convenient for me, not because it's, it's uh, profitable for me, not because I like to do it, but because it's the because right thing. Because it's a rule. Or because it's a rule, I do it because it's the right thing to do. How do we convince people they need to take that approach? How do you get somebody to, how do you train them to put gas in the gas tank and oil in the crankcase? There are so many other fluids that could go in there. Yeah. <laughs> that it's reminds me of my dad once when I was really little. He was mowing the lawn, got to the last strip, and the motor quit. He, he was out of gas. Well, he just kind of muttered to himself, and I remember his bro my brother saying, well, why don't you just put water in the gas tank? <laughs> and he says, well, because it doesn't burn. Well, that was a good answer. But, um, yeah, you're right. They, you have to do the right things to, I mean, for the right way to make it work. That's, is basically that's exactly it. the point. We need to convince them that that's the way it works. How do we convince people that, that we love them, that we accept them, and, and, and in such a convincing way that they're attracted to us and to our church. Well, Norman Vincent Peale wrote a book I read a long time ago, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Mm -hmm. That really had a lot of good things in it. And he said you get people interested by being, you get more friends by being interested in other people than by getting them interested in you. You don't yeah. try to get them interested in you. You, are, you just express interest in them. Mm. That was Dale Carnegie, I think. Oh, was that Dale Carnegie? Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to get the wrong impression. Dale Carnegie. Thank you. It was not a, it was not a theologian, I, but at I least he... I read Norman Vincent Peale, too, so yeah, yeah it was... <laughs> uh -huh. okay. I had uh, a very interesting experience with Norman Vincent Peale. He, uh, I was on my way to Europe, straight out of college, and we had this summer a break, and I was with another friend. We were on our way, and we, have, we had Sunday, all day Sunday in New York City. We'd, we were to fly out that evening. So we decided we were going to go to the Marble Collegiate Church where he was preaching. And his sermon that day was on Colossians 20, verse 20. <laughs> there is no 20 <laughs> chapters in Colossians. What do you mean there's no 20 <laughs> Well, it turns out that he preached this whole sermon from Second Chronicles 20, verse 20, which is a good sermon, but he recognized that his audience probably wouldn't be ex so excited about the Old Testament. <laughs> Nobody in the audience probably even knew that he was preaching from the wrong testament completely, and he quoted it several times. Colossians 20, verse 20. We wrote, we wrote a letter back to him. It says, um, we observed that you were preaching from Second Chronicles 20, 20, not Colossians 20, 20. I just wondered why you chose to do that. And we got a form letter back that says, we hope the next time you're in New York City, you'll visit the Marble Collegiate Church. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you had a great experience, but it was hardly worth the postage. <laughs> yeah. Over the last 30 years, does it seem like the church is moving closer to the world or the world is, moving, is being won over to the church? Well, many standards, and I'm using that in quotation marks, that were considered by some to be very important 30 years ago have been largely abandoned by the church. Is that a sign of progress because the church is abandoning irrelevant issues and focusing on what is really important? Or is this really backsliding? Do we see, and here's, the, here's I think the really tough question, but it's a really important question. Do we see around us, and maybe in us hopefully, a core group of Christians that are emerging to form the 144,000 that will be God's final people? I think so. Well, if they were, well then he'd have to come before they died, right? That's what worries me. Or he, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, 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 they, or they would have to be replaced when that time came. <laughs> it sounds like an ongoing thing. <laughs> we, we, we believe that the gift of God's grace is completely free, and, and it certainly is. At the same time, it, it's more valuable than anything else in the whole universe. You can't buy it for any price. 
At the same time, we recognize that accepting the call to the gospel and accepting the changes in our lives that are necessary, the ones that Jesus advises us to make, can be a real struggle. So how do we make it easier for people? And what about us? Have we paid a price for our commitment to Jesus Christ? Well, how do we make it easier for people? Well, that was one you of know, the questions. A lot, a lot of times we, we put a little more on it than necessary. We make it's, it more difficult. Yeah, make it a little more difficult. This is just like the early missionaries to Africa, right? They mm -hmm. tried to convert them over to be like English people, mm -hmm. you know, which is, wasn't really necessary, was it? No. Uh, so a lot of times you really need to find out what's really essential and uh, go for that. Well, has it cost any of us any major expense, major problem, major efforts to be Christians? Insignificant compared to what the Creator did. Yeah. Uh, lost some friends. Yeah. Um, sister doesn't particularly like it at all and, and like it's a stay away. Um, mm -hmm. I've met several Adventists where their families were not happy mm -hmm. with okay. um, either them becoming Christian or especially Seventh-day Adventists. Yeah. Do we ever consider how richly we're blessed because we are Christians? Yeah. Well, what price did Jesus and his disciples and Paul pay for their commitment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? How does the devil... Do, 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 are you saying that we today need that level of commitment? Yes. How, how, how would it hurt us? <laughs> Isn't that what you said? That's what I said. <laughs> well, but you think but that but really none but none yeah. But nonetheless, is that the level of commitment yeah. that we're being called to? Yes. Well just And look at, uh, let's be honest. If the devil saw even one of us or a small group of us on fire and we were really just hauling people in and we were really convincing them and they're becoming Christians and they were getting on fire and you know, it looks like the end was coming. What do you think the devil would do? He would do anything he could to sabotage that. Anything he possibly could do to sabotage this. Men are in peril. Multitudes are perishing. But how few of the professed followers of Christ are burdened for these souls? Yeah. I think we are beginning to live in a hostile world mm -hmm. uh, with, not with maybe common folks that you meet, but with the newspaper and the media, yeah. um, Christianity is in a hostile environment. Yeah, absolutely. The media today is not friendly to Christianity. Mm -mm, mm -mm. They still feel that Christianity is backwards, mm -hmm. that it's controlling, that it's dominating, mm -hmm. that they don't want to have anything to do with it. But doesn't, doesn't that, that go along with the, the devil's propaganda about living for self, living free, living for all yep. you can get today, exactly. forget about tomorrow. But, but when there's a flood or there's a tsunami, we're all praying. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when it's convenient, get, God, get lost. Stay out of our way. But when we need you, not right now, God, I want help. Isn't that what happens? Well, all of us have attended Bible studies, even evangelistic series or a revelation seminar, perhaps, or some other special form of Bible study or, or group meeting. How have we been Im impacted by these occasions? How should we respond to people who do not immediately grasp everything that was discussed and are still wavering at the end of these meetings? Should we say, well, you had your chance. Sorry, buddy. Invite him to the next. <laughs> Well, one way to get a good feel for people's issues and to ask is, is to ask them open-ended questions. And here's some questions that were suggested by our Bible study guide. What do you think that these verses are saying to us today? How would you share this Bible truth with a friend? How do you feel about God's promise to you? What changes do you think you need to make in your life and your attitude toward others and in how you live in general because of what you have been studying? 
how do these truths help you to love Jesus more? Of all the things you've been learning, what impressed you the most? What gives you the most hope? And the question that we like to talk about all the time, what does this story or this book say to you about God? Well, sometimes in the past we've been guilty of trying to give people too much, too fast. As we've already suggested, one of the most powerful appeals for the gospel is to love people, accept them into our homes, treat them as friends. At the same time, it's a good idea to continually ask open, but I mean fair, but open-ended questions to determine if there are still doubts and some questions in their mind, and, and of course, where possible to try to answer those questions. Think about the process a person goes through in his progress from being a person of the world to becoming a Christian. You know, I think the most important is Bible study from the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, I spoke to my sister this morning, another one, and uh, she had watched a program on TV which had things a little wrong. Uh, she was describing it to me, and she really hasn't read for herself, so I was encouraging her to read for herself. And this... this um, it fit in typical today. It was about how the Bible uh, put down females and Eve was responsible for sin. And I think it was a feminist type program. And then she says, well, I've tried reading the Old Testament. She says, but I find it a testosterone driven book. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that. And, and, uh, but when you do an, it in, was. when you do an in-depth study and you ask the questions like you did and, and what, uh, what is this telling us about God? You come out with a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Without those questions, you're kind of lost. If we see people taking maybe timid first steps toward Christianity, what should we do? Grab them and say, hurry up, come on, keep moving. Hmm? You, you, you people are on the front lines here. You're supposed to be the ones with the right answers. Well, I don't quite understand your question. How well, I mean see. timid and then, well, you need to be gentle for one thing. Yeah, okay. You don't go up and say, you know what, when you make a decision for Jesus, you're going to keep it. Or you're gonna, even if something happens to you and you go <laughs> like that, you don't want to say that first. I mean, what <laughs> happens <laughs> What happens is that when people get <laughs> like that, it's because they really value him, and it takes time for that to happen. And you can't convince that to a person right off the bat. I mean, it takes a, it takes some a while and you know, experience. It, it's interesting. The, the Philippian jailer took a few minutes, one night, mm -hmm. and Paul said to him, "Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're saved." Yeah, but what happened to him was spectacular more than what a lot of people go through. They, I mean, he, listened to him, he listened to him sing all night. Then this big earthquake happened. Then, then he thought he was a goner, so he's going to kill himself. I mean, how many guys get converted that way? I mean, that's pretty, it's pretty spectacular if you ask me. So, yeah, you're it right. It, was a a, it didn't take a long time, but that was kind of a jolt. I've had a very interesting experience with several people that I've had the privilege of working with who have actually decided to become Adventists eventually. And one of the first ways you can tell that they're really thinking about what they're learning is they start telling their friends. And they'll say to you, you know what? I, I, that thing we talked about, I, I, was, I was talking to my friend about it. I, I, you know, and he said this and this. And you know that they're thinking about it real seriously when they start talking like that. Well, That's a good clue. There is a lot of, there, you're seeing the work of the Holy Spirit happening mm -hmm. too then when that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's that I, missing ingredient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I tried to hurry someone along, uh, a gentleman in the water aerobics class that asked questions. And I says, well, I'll give you a book. And he says, I don't want a book. He says, I just want to talk about this. Mm -hmm. So they, have, they go at their own pace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jesus told the story about the sower and the seed. You remember some of it fell on the good soil, and some of it fell on the path, and some fell among thorns, and some fell among the rocky soil. And each one of them had a different response. And we need to recognize that we're going we're gonna to find people in those different categories if we start really reaching out to people. Some people are going to be real excited about it at the beginning, and then they're going to fade. Other people are going to, some people are going to say, 
wow, that's great, and they're going to just grow and, and be pretty soon they're going to be witnessing. But there's others who are going to say, leave me alone, I won't have anything to do with that. So we need to recognize. We rec need to recognize that we can't just go out and scatter the seed and say, okay, I'm done now. You know, what would happen to the farmer if he never did anything more than just throw the seeds out in, in the middle of a field of weeds or something, you know? You have to prepare the soil. You have to sow the seed. You have to water it. You have to fertilize it if necessary. You know, it's, it, it, this is not a just simple kind of a process. Well, one further consideration we need to think about is that different people have different abilities to appeal to different groups. Maybe you are comfortable speaking with educated people. Another group is very comfortable working with children. Somebody else likes to work with students who are really trying to, to, to learn. Some groups are good at working with retired people. Or drug addicts. Or even drug addicts. Some people reach out to the unemployed. So we need to recognize that, you know, one of the things we might need to do is look for the, the group, the niche where we belong. Oh, we haven't mentioned one, prisons. Yeah. They have a long time to study. Yeah. So we are beginning to understand the challenge of reaching out and bringing others into the fold. Do we know how to provide a nurturing, protective environment for them? Are we keeping our eyes open for physical, economic, and personal felt needs as opening doors to approach spiritual needs? We must recognize that even Christ, with his consummate skills, could not win everyone. We just, we, a few moments ago, we read John, part of John 6. And what about Judas? I mean, surely Judas had a, enough opportunity to learn if he wanted to. And we, we should never make the state, mistake of trying to choke the truth down people. It just doesn't work. Well, some of us may try to avoid the responsibility of witnessing by saying, well, I'm not a trained pastor. I don't, I'm not an evangelist. I don't know my Bible. I don't know the biblical languages, da-da-da-da, whatever their excuse is. But how much training do you need to feed the hungry? How much training do you need to give a thirsty person a drink? How much, how much training do you need to be hospitable to a stranger? I mean, we need to be reasonable about this. Being hospitable, hospitable to strangers isn't always the safest thing to do in our day. Uh, and that's a, that's a tough... I mean, also, we can treat the people around us. Like, how mm -hmm. many of us bring water to our gardeners? Are you thirsty? Yeah. Or if they come over and we have fruit on the tree to send them away with some of the fruit. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes there's people around us that we don't even um, see. Mm -hmm. Well, Christ makes it very clear that we need to keep our eyes open for those who are in need, whatever that need is. There's lots of places. We mentioned Matthew 25, 35 to 40, but there's places in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 15 and Job 29 and... Isaiah 58. And what we see in those passages is love in action. Isn't this the basic mode of operation of God's kingdom? It is the predominant motivation in the lives of true Christians. But it's just the opposite of what motivates people of the world. So how do we convince people that we should act out of love? Or they should act out of love? Should we start practicing, practicing it even here? before we enter heaven? I mean, if, if love is going to be the, mo the predominant motive of everybody who enters heaven, shouldn't we start practicing now? Well, practicing love includes reaching out to people who are different from us in various ways. So embracing diversity is an essential part of love for our neighbors. But review in your mind the basic teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and even of Christianity as, whole, as a whole. What would you classify as the milk of the word, the, the simple truths? Forgiveness? God's love? What would you include in those the simple teachings that you could speak to almost anybody about? Just God, for the first thing. Mm -hmm. The uh, truth I about God? Start talking about God. I mean, I think everybody, I haven't run into anybody that's never even heard about God before. Shall I take you to China? Well, yeah. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. maybe he, they're just thinking about him a different way. And yeah. who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and, and, and what, what things would be the solid food? If that's the milk, what would be the solid food? <laughs> <laughs> well, some people would say, you know, the uh, sanctuary doctrine or uh, uh, the 2300 day prophecy or the great controversy. The great controversy, yeah. And those are very interesting studies. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I tell you, if, if I had to do the same Sabbath, well, sometimes I do. I, I hear the same old Sabbath schools year after year after year. Ever since I was young, it's the same old thing, you know, and it, I want something more sometimes mm -hmm. to get a little deeper. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the most effective ways of getting people interested in the Bible and Bible study is going through the Bible book by book and asking the one all-important question, what does this book or story tell us about God? Now, I think everyone in this room has had an opportunity to do at least some of that. Some of us have done it many times. I've done it 30, 40 times. And Dr. Graham Maxwell, who was my mentor, had done it 140 times, something like that. And what does that, what does that do? How do you do it? Now, you might say, well, man, I'm no scholar. How could I lead a group? Well, I can tell you that on our website, and that's www.theox.org, there are study guides, student study guides that you can just hand to people and say, go home and and look at these questions. And then there are teacher's guides that give you sort of the answers to those questions. And it basically just focuses on that basic issue. What does this story, what does this book say about God? And I find that one of the most rewarding, absolutely most rewarding ways to study the Bible ever. You know, anybody can have a group like this. Yeah. And you don't really need a leader either. You can have a host. Yeah. You know, just bring everybody together. Let's just open it up and see what we come up with. Yeah. So. Yeah. Especially with those detailed guides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're free. Yeah, those are free. You can download them. Uh, if you have a question about how to promote that or something, uh, write to us at info at theox.org. Or perhaps if you'd even like these guides that we use in our, in our discussion here together, on the Sabbath school, uh, just send, uh, go, go to the uh, theox.org or, or send us a, 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 an email to info at theox.org and we'll see if we can help you. Uh, we're not pretending that we have all the answers, far from it, but we've found that this is a really, really exciting way to approach the scripture and a very comfortable way to invite your friends to join you in studying the scripture. So give it a try. Have a look for yourself and see if you can answer the questions. See you next week.